I deployed $5,000 on them to win. And I remember going crazy. What's the craziest way that you've spent winnings from a bet? Um, probably just like was able to spend almost anything and everything. What advice, Afon, do you have for regular sports bettors? I think the number one advice I could give to any gambler is... I'm gonna turn around and you're gonna say the slogan. Win more together. All right, I am here on the Dub Club CEO Corner with Afon from Hydro Parlay. Afon, what's going on? Not much, Ryan. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. So some background on Afan. Uh, he is a Minnesotan. He's actually based pretty close to St. Paul. Uh, some some people don't realize that Afan played uh, esports competitively for a little while back then. We'll hear more about that soon. But in spring 2022, he decided to quit his job and pursue his hydro parlay business full time. And then a year later, he decided to ditch his Patreon and move his business to Dub Club. And he hasn't looked back. Afan, every great entrepreneur has an origin story. I want to rewind the clock really quickly. Can you tell me about your first big sports betting memory? Um, my first big sports betting memory. Yeah, I, I think that would have to be tied to uh, esports because that's um, how I like was first getting back into it. It was a little bit of basketball and esports. So uh, I downloaded an app during COVID called Monkey Knife Fight, which is no longer here with <laughs> us, but they had both basketball and uh, League of Legends. Um, and I, I played basketball a lot growing up, um, but when I saw the League of Legends and CSGO section on the app, it intrigued me and what brought me back into esports. So initially I downloaded the app off a friend's recommendation to get back into some NBA betting, um, but it was a blessing in disguise uh, seeing that, hey, some of these apps online offer esports um, and me being uh, very obsessed with esports as a kid growing up, uh, I went full head first back into it. So monkey, monkey knife fight. At the origin of the hydro parlay story. Yep, that at least for me, uh, sports betting by myself was monkey knife fight, um, and yeah. then eventually transitioned over to prize picks and underdog and all the other sites. Now that I'm luckily affiliated with, what was it about monkey knife fight that got you hooked originally? Was it did they just had better lines? You could find you yeah, know, so easy, they, an easier edge. I mean, what was it? Yeah, so they had um, esports. So really it was just basically off a friend's recommendation to download the app and they had uh, some esports kill lines, they had assists as well as fantasy score. Um, and that helped the variety of props help me jump right back into it. Um, and I'd never seen any sort of esports betting um, online before. So it was very refreshing um, since yep. when I first started gambling, it was more of going to the casinos um, and playing like card games. Um, so once COVID hit that whole trajectory of online gambling and online sports betting, uh, really took over. Um, and thanks to my friend, Aaron, who recommended me monkey, monkey knife fight. Um, it's what helped me explore all these other apps that are now, um, in our ecosystem. Yeah. Were you, so it, it sounds like you, you were playing table games and going to the casino. Were you any good at that? Yeah, I was actually really good at a go a casino. I, I was, <laughs> uh, luckily, here in Minnesota... I love, how, I love how quick you were to respond. Yeah, I was pretty damn good at that. Yeah, here in Minnesota, um, the age is 18. I know some states are 21 to gamble. So yeah. I started off pretty yeah. young going my like... Senior Man, I might have to move to Minnesota. <laughs> my senior year, of uh, senior year of high school, actually, started gambling with a lot of my high school buddies... Um, and it became like, honestly, like a weekend sort of thing where we would go every weekend and gamble. And then I got um, pretty addicted to it and started learning how to count cards and getting really into like the whole blackjack scene. Um, so that's kind of what initially started me um, into gambling was playing at the casinos and playing the card games and learning how to card count. Um, and once uh, COVID hit, stopped, couldn't go to the casino as much anymore. And that's Luckily, one of the friends who I went to the casino with a lot was like, hey, you should check out Monkey Knife Fight. Um, and then the rest is history from there. I downloaded prize picks with him, Underdog, 
um, and found some, you know, online casinos as well. You're a pretty smart guy, Fon. How did you learn how to count cards? Like, what did you, are you like a math guy? Yeah, I was, I was, I was really into math growing up. Um, mm. Took a lot of accelerated classes. I took up to AP Calc in high school and took Calc 3 as well um, in, wow. in high school. Um, so math. I failed that when I was at Stanford. I remember. <laughs> yeah, so math was math was something that was like one of my really good cornerstones um, just in uh, high school. So it was always something that intrigued me. Um, and then I just started watching YouTube videos about you know card, counting cards. Um, and then someone in my math class as well was really into it um, as well. Um, and me and him would always go back and forth talking about it, and we would go to the casino too together um, and learn from each other. Um, so I think my affinity for math or just being good at it definitely helped me spring forward into blackjack have you ever seen the movie rain man i have not seen that movie oh you gotta watch okay. it you'd love it <laughs> you'd love it that's a that's a weekend movie for you okay i'll, I'll write it down it up on Saturday. yeah um so afan i i want to get into the ceo like main section which is talking a little bit about what your business does and how you would sell it the, the ceo of any company is ultimately responsible for selling, you know, the vision of a company, of an organization, of a product, of a service. I can tell you I'm responsible for that for Dub Club. Everyone wins more together with Dub Club. I'll say that a million times before I die. For you, let's say I am hypothetically someone that knows nothing about Hydro Parlay and I am a prospective subscriber, like I bet on sports. How would you describe what you do to me such that, you know, I'm incentivized or enticed to subscribe to you. Yeah. So, uh, I could tell you that I've been playing slash watching esports for over a decade now. So I'm someone who is very familiar with the scene and someone who knows the scene in and out very, very well as being a part of it myself, as well as now betting on it. Um, yep. So I could tell you that I am an expert in esports. So if you're looking for somebody to help you uh, learn the ropes, joining the Discord would probably be the best package for you because there you can immediately contact me and talk with me if you're struggling on learning things or if you need uh, resources or websites to help you do the research. Everything is available in the Discord. Um, so it would have to be somebody who is wanting to learn more about esports or someone who wants to learn more about a specific category. Um, I cover uh, League of Legends, CSGO, Rocket League, Valorant very well. Uh, and luckily I have some mods in my Discord who do Call of Duty now for me. Um, so uh, basically any esport out there on the prize picks or on underdog, um, if you're looking to get into it, um, joining our Discord and just being in the chats can just help you learn. If you don't even want to bet on it, just help you learn, understand the process of why are we betting on this? Which team should win, you know, odds for, you know, each game. Um, joining the Discord would definitely help you in that perspective. I love it. And it's interesting because it's kind of like asking me why I think I might be a good football coach. Like I played football for 17 years. You played competitive esports. Can you talk a little bit about what that looked like? I mean, what, you know, like what, I, I, like, I don't even know how to, is it what games did you play or like what, you know, yeah, yeah, how do yeah. you even so, frame it? So, and tell us about the history there. Exactly. So now, nowadays it's a lot more like commercialized and socially accepted uh, within the yeah. like world. But back then, very popular. Yeah, it's very popular. But back when yeah. I was starting esports, it was very grassroots and ground up. There wasn't too much infrastructure or you know, big VC companies b behind a lot of these yep. uh, brands yet. So a lot of it was peer-to-peer -peer gambling. So what I did um, at first was I was obsessed growing up playing Call of Duty like a lot of kids are of uh, yeah. my age. So I played a lot of- I was of a big Call of Duty zombies guy exactly. if you played that. A lot yeah. of people uh, played Call of Duty. A lot of, new, a lot of people knew me in school for the guy who was really good at COD. Um, because I, that is a legendary <laughs> thing for people that it's like a fun, the cod guy. Exactly. Cause I was just awesome. fully indulged and invested all my time after school. Um, if it wasn't sports, it was either playing cod with my friends online. So, yeah. uh, first it was casual, you know, just playing around, but eventually it started getting good after a year or two. 
um, and got into a scene called Game Battles, which is essentially playing either 2v2 or 4v4 against another team um, on, on a website. And basically you would record your gameplay um, and you would play other people who would join the website. And then at the end of the match, you would go on the website and say who won. And a lot of times, you know, people would be like, no, I won when, you know, you won yourself. So recording was the only way to verify if you, wow. know, you actually won the map or not. So for the most part, people were pretty good about it, but you got some angry people who, who lost and didn't want to give their money. So recording, yeah. recording your gameplay was like the way of verifying if you actually won the match or not. That's like the ultimate honor system. I cannot mean, yeah, yeah that was purely back when there was no infrastructure. Like people would self-report wins. It, that's insane. Exactly. That's how it was uh, back in the day. Um, so essentially I was doing that for uh, two to three years, just on the website, game battles, just grinding them out, um, playing with my friend, my good friend Trent. Um, and we would, yeah, just grind those out every day, play peer to peer. Um, some amateur teams approached us after a while. Um, and I got in, got into some amateur play, some more for, instead of doing 2v2, we were doing more 4v4. Um, okay. So did that for about a year in, uh, during Black Ops 2, um, where ranked was more uh, legitimized and they started having more of an infrastructure. Um, and then once that was around my, uh, I wanna say senior year of high school, um, and then once college hit, I kind of took a break from esports and kind of just put that past aside me um, and more focused on school because it was very, very time consuming because it would be after school, it would be like, you know, another six, eight hours just playing COD every day and then it would go back to sleep. Wow. Um, so going to college definitely put had me like put down the sticks, um, but I made, you know, decent money while I was doing so it would be like as you know, a 14, 15 year old making a couple hundred bucks, you know, online. And then, you know, come to my senior year when I was around 18, I remember making like three grand in a weekend because we were just wow. on a heater. Um, so it was just crazy. Um, but like I said, not much infrastructure at the time and it was still very peer to peer what I was doing. Uh, but seeing other esports like League of Legends and Counter Strike having these uh, tournaments and starting to grow more, um, I I started swaying my attention more to them as I stopped playing Call of Duty and got more interested into PC gaming. Um, yeah. So that was that whole transition happened during um, my high school sort of phase, high school until like college. Started learning more about League, started playing it um, as well in my spare time. Granted, I wasn't as good as I was playing Call of Duty just due to the sheer amount of hours I was putting into COD versus the sheer mm -hmm. amount of hours I was putting into the other esports. Uh, I'd like to say I could get to that level, but it'd definitely take a lot of time um, and a lot of dedication to it because now the people who are playing are were doing the same thing that I was doing um, when I yeah. was you know, 14, 15 years old. So decided to take more of a back approach and just enjoy the competitiveness of the esports by watching. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what, what made me fall in love to the scene was seeing how passionate and how driven some of these players were to winning and learning their stories um, made me fall in love with, you know, esports in general and just seeing people play at the highest level uh, would make me, you know, want to play the game myself and play. Um, although I couldn't play to the highest level with them, it definitely made me uh, motivated and wanted to learn more about it. I love it. What an awesome story. And my, my mind goes to a couple things in that, that I'll double click on. The first thing is making, you know, a couple hundred dollars online back when you were 14, 15 years old at 18, you're making like a, a couple thousand over the weekend, a few thousand over a weekend. Fast forward to now where you're running a business online, giving advice on what to bet on for esports, and you're making you know, well, well more than that. I mean, you're, you're making a sustainable six figure plus a year business. When I think about, uh, what, what, what you spend your money on and where you invest, you know, your money from a business standpoint with your CEO hat on, what, what, how do you spend the money that comes through obviously after, you know, 
uh, the earnings you make from your dub club, like uh, what other costs do you have to pay down other than like dub club as your technology partners, anything else that, that you put money back into? I mean, how do you spend it? Yeah. So initially I was more on the solo independent route. I had a lot of other friends and people hit me up being like, Hey, you know, let's join, let's collaborate, let's do this, you know, as a mm. business. Um, but me knowing how, how people are online and dealing with a lot of people online in the past, I wanted to take it on solo as my own, you know, adventure and own uh, business. But later going on as a CEO, I realized how important or how valuable, you know, partnerships with other people yeah. can be. So once I found uh, a couple people that I could trust and was tailing their bets and seeing their bets as they go along, who are a part of the community, I would reach out to mm -hmm. them in the Discord chat and be like, hey, I see you very active in the Call of Duty chat. Me, myself, I used to play Call of Duty a lot. I'm not too familiar with the scene as much anymore. Would you want to, you know, post plays under the Call of Duty section with me? Same thing with Valorant, same thing with tennis. And now luckily I have three moderators in the Discord who are now posting and who are paid uh, monthly for posting their plays as well. Um, so it, it, it relieves a little stress off my shoulders because now I know I got another team of people posting plays for them and can make me focus on the categories that I'm really good at. Um, so building, awesome. building the Discord was great in terms of community interaction as well as people in the community actually coming and being a part of my business. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, that's what it's all about is growing, you know, within internally within the business um, and those who I see who are loyal and who have been there for a while um, and who I can trust with my money. Um, I definitely have given them, you know, the raise and the, the proper roles to do what they need to do. Love that. You know what is is awesome in all of that? It's It's something I've done a lot of studying into recently, and that is the who behind a business, not necessarily the what. So a little anecdote, Dub Club, which you may know, you've met a lot of the people on the team of fun, but we're over 20 employees now. So 20 Dub Clubbers going strong, as we like to call us, Dub, dub Clubbers. <laughs> and what is interesting, uh, when I like, I dug into people and you know what people mean to driving forward a company, an organization, a team, in a survey of hundreds of like, the best CEOs, the number one thing is like over 60% of them reported that the the main driver of business value is people. It's like people that you put in place to sort of manage specific roles and responsibilities. And then after that, it was like 20% said execution. So like doing things, which would be like things that you're doing as, as CEO and things that other people are doing kind of ad hoc. And then like under that is like strategy, which your strategy you've described to me, like you, you focus on esports and that's really where you make your bread and butter. Mm -hmm. But I just think that's so fascinating that people is such a core part of what makes a business hum. Because if it's, if, if it's seen as a machine, Hydro Parlay is a machine, you're one cog. Like you're a huge cog and you're, you're really making it go. Like I'd say you're the engine, really. And then you've got other moving parts that are within that machine that make it hum. Yep. You know, the machine can't go faster with only one gear. Like you've got to be able to shift and it's really hard to do that as the only person. I can tell you from experience, I was doing it for a year and a half myself back when I was DMing you in 2021, <laughs> 2022. And you're probably like, who is this guy? Like now we've got a team that they're way smarter than I am and they're doing all the hard stuff. Yeah, as a CEO, you kind of want to take responsibility and want to do it all on your own and have that, you know, I can do it sort of um, mentality. But, you know, totally. seeking help or seeing other people um, who may be better at something that you're doing can definitely, um, you know, lift your business as well as, you know, they scratch your back, you scratch their back. And that's kind of how, you know, the Discord community works is when, you know, people are helping other people cash out, you know, they're going to want to see them post more. Um, and, you know, if this is, someone is posting consistently in the chats um, and he's helping out, out our community, I'm definitely going to want to help him because he's helping out, you know everyone else in the chats. So that's kind of how uh, I've ran it as well as seeing other people, you know, just vouch for me or other people who are sharp betters who wanted to join the Discord. I've always given uh, people a chance. Um, but when I first started, I kind of had the same 
sort of mentality of just like, I can do it by myself. You know, I'm the one who's starting this business. You know, it's all me. But later on, definitely realize that the more people you can have to trust and to help you, uh, the better the business or the smoother the business can sail. Amen. I'm going to turn around and, and you're going to say the mission of the company again. Just the, the slogan. It's on the back of my shirt. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, win more together. Amen. You can win a lot on your own, but you win more together. That's what dub club means. Dub, win, club, doing it together. People, people make the world go round. So, Afan, we're going to move into some fun questions uh, first and then some keeping it real questions. But first thing, what's the most money you've ever won in a single bet? And what prompted you to make that bet? Yeah, so I remember betting on League of Legends Worlds uh, uh, like two or th- two years ago. Um, and basically, I, I, would, I was actually at the arena. So I was there watching the games live. Uh, and wow. that's kind of what prompted me to put a lot more money on the line was being live in the stadium. I yeah, was enjoying the vacation. It was in Atlanta. So at the State Farm Arena in Atlanta, we were watching people play, you know, video games in front of each other. Um, and I think being on vacation definitely prompted me to put a little bit more than I would have on the bet. Um, but after seeing the draft, essentially when the players pick the champions, I really liked one of the team's, um, you know, outlooks into the game. So right before the game actually started and they picked the champions that they were going to play, I, de- I deployed... Uh, $5,000 on them to win $10,000. So it was a plus wow. 100 type of bet. Um, going back and forth, um, I let one of my good friends, Miles, who is also part of Dub Club, we were uh, mm-hmm. sweating it out together. Um, and he wanted to put some money on the account with me. So I put another 500 for him too, so that he could sweat it out with me too. Um, and we ended up winning the bet after a while. And I remember going crazy with him um, in the suite. And then we definitely went out drinking that night after that. It was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> that is awesome. I love how you referred to putting your money down as deploying it. Yeah. It's like I was deploying the capital. It's like, do you think like an investor? It's awesome. Yep. I mean, that's, that's how it is um, at this point. It's just like... Yeah. Whether you you're flip, investing your capital, whether you flip or whether you lose, you gotta you know figure out how you want to manage manage the funds. Amen. So it sounds like you guys went drinking after this big win. I'm I'm sure there are other memories that you have of crazier ways to spend your money. What's the craziest way that you've spent winnings from a bet? Um, I'd say the craziest way I've spent winnings from the bet is probably just like traveling a lot. So uh, last summer, I was able to go to Japan. Um, and when I was in Japan, I you know, was able to spend almost anything and everything while I was there, spending a lot of my winnings um, there. Yeah. So that was probably the best. And the best thing about it was getting the tax-free money back after spending yep. it because buying stuff in a foreign country. So I remember getting a lot of clothes, a lot of uh, like action figures, a lot of cards, uh, out in Japan because what kind of cards um, there were different like Pokemon cards as well as um, just other trading cards uh, over yeah, there. So very cool. got a bunch of different things. I got a bunch of designer clothes too while I was out there. Um, so it was very, very nice way of spending my money as well as being able to travel. And um, I went with my whole family too. So they didn't have to worry about their expenses as well because I was doing pretty well off at that point and won pretty big during the summer uh, l- last summer. That is awesome. So it was, you know, a, a blessing being able to, you know, take care of them as well on vacation. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, br- so brother and sister? Yep, brother, and sister, mom and dad, and a sister's Amazing. fiance and her husband as well, and her, her dad as well. So it was a total of eight of us. Oh, wow. What a squad. Yep. That's awesome. Um, there was a lot packed in there that I want to unpack. I think the number one thing that I heard, which is really interesting, and you tell me if this is right or wrong, but you basically have two revenue streams at any given point in time. You've got the winnings from the bets that you're placing, and then you've got your, your earnings, your dub club earnings coming in. 
do you spend that money differently? Like, do you, is the winnings from your your bets more disposable, and the winnings from your dub club earnings you view more as just like purely your, you know, it, like it'd be your paycheck or like the the you know profit from the business that you're you're putting away for a rainy day? Like, how do you view the two of them? Exactly, Ryan. I do it exactly like how you said, where I have two separate bank accounts, where in one bank account, my dub club money goes in there. I only touch that when I am want to make a big purchase or mm. want to, you know, do investments. So Yeah, like a new car or something exactly, or like exactly. put money down in like Amazon. Exactly. And that's how I was able to yeah. afford my new car was through yeah. the dub club ecosystem and not that's, necessarily that's awesome. my bets. But that's awesome. That that money doesn't really touch my betting account unless I'm like really low on funds, and that hasn't happened within the la- within joining you guys. So I haven't really yeah. had to pull money out of the Dub Club account to go and gamble it. That money is more of just a safety net, um, sitting there, and that money every month goes uh, half of that half of my Dub Club paycheck goes into my investments. My um, Fidelity and Schwab accounts. So I know yep. that in the long term, no matter what, I have money saved back in the market. And then yep. the other planning ha- for your future family. Exactly. And then the other half yeah, is just it. still sitting there in the bank accounts. If I want to maybe take a trip, maybe make a big purchase, or you know, if I end up purchasing a house in the future, that will be there to, you know, help me as well as paying off taxes. That's amazing. You know, it's kind of fun. I actually talked to, there's one, one guy I had on the show. Uh, it was our first episode, Dead Prez Picks, Matt. He, he's 26, 27, and he bought a house a couple weeks ago. He's already having issues. Like this week, his pipe burst, and he had to like fly back home to fix it <laughs> with his fiance. But uh, yeah, it was him, Chili Bats, who I'll have on the show soon. And then a couple other guys are all, it's like, I feel like everyone's buying houses. I'm, I'm a little behind. I'm, <laughs> I'm almost 30. I need, need a house at some point. But in the Bay Area, it's almost impossible yeah. to find something that's yeah. even remotely reasonable. Uh, but anyway, so let's move on to um, what I call the keeping it real section, which is, you know, I think it's more just like you as a person, uh, like it's abstracting you from the brand and from the business, talking about you. I mean, same thing with me. I'll be the first to admit running a company is really stressful. It's really hard. I mean, my goodness, man, like it, it, you got to find ways to relax. How do you relieve your stress? What do you do for fun? Like, tell us about some of the hobbies you have. Yeah. So honestly, it, it kind of goes like full circle with me, um, with, you know, playing the video games so competitively, I've started to get into other games that are less competitive and more casual, um, sort yeah. of playing. So, um, there's this game called uh, Stardew Valley that I started playing with my girlfriend so that we would play nice. that uh, together when we were, you know, uh, when she was at her place and I'm at my place and we needed yeah, to, you awesome. know, break some time together. We would play that, you know, very relaxing. Does she beat you? <laughs> no, it's not like a, it's more of like a co-op kind of game where you work together and you farm and you grow stuff. And that's awesome. So it's not, it's not, it, it takes the whole competitive, you know, scene or yeah, time. you guys work together. Like you're, you know, growing up first, growing a farm and then, you know, growing a family in the future. Exactly. You know, exactly. You know. So started playing that, uh, more casually. Um, I, I myself am just a competitive person myself. So yeah. I, oh, I've uh, noticed g- get into sports. It. I have a lifetime membership. So, um, each week I try and go to lifetime and, uh, either shoot hoops on my own or play pickup with the people around. Um, so I think going to the gym is definitely one of the key things that I've incorporated in my schedule where it's like, um, it's kind of like a non-negotiable at this point where it's like, I got to go to the gym at least, you know, four to five times during the week uh, w- just with all the time that I have um, and can be doing. Um, so it, luckily enough, I'm able to squeeze that in most of the times during the afternoon where it isn't as busy yep. at the gym, um, and then during the uh, during the nights, uh, more focus on work. Um, but I'd say gym, sports, as well as instead of playing, you know, video games competitively, which I've been doing my whole life, trying to find more like casual and fun games that are more relaxing and don't have, uh, you know, a competitive side to it. Totally. Yeah, I like the. I, I go to the gym as well. I, that's my evening routine. It's actually new. I just got a gym membership a month ago. Where'd you get it at? Uh, 
It's nearby. I live in Burlingame. It's the only like you've been to our office in in Millbrae. Yep. Uh, this it's the only gym within like a ten mile radius. So it's expensive, and I think I'm probably one of the youngest people that goes there. <laughs> it's like a, you know fifty and older type gym, but it's yep. huge. It's like a full fitness club with a you know two basketball courts, pool, you know sauna, steam room, everything. Yep. But what I what I was listening, I was listening to a podcast recently. And I've also read uh, a bunch of like habit forming books. And it's really interesting because the way you describe the gym is like non-negotiable. If you, as long as you do something and get to a point where you're doing something that feels good and you're like, yeah, this relieves stress, your body almost naturally and your mind naturally just like works it into your process. And then you like start to realize if it's not in your process, it's some, like something's missing. Mm-hmm. So I think when, when people think about building habits, especially if you feel really stressed, it's like, you just need to find that one thing or the one or two things that you, like, you know will relieve your stress and do it. And then like you'll just start doing it over and over. Like I just naturally know like 6.30 every night, I'm like, I got to get out to the gym. Yeah. Like the day is crushing me and it's time to go shoot a couple hoops and take a dip in the pool and jump in the, jump in the sauna for 10 minutes with the 65-year-old men around me. <laughs> Honestly, as a better, it's, it's been helping me to like, you know, take out my stress and I put it towards the gym. You know, if I have a totally. bad day, you know, I can take my anger out on the weights and instead of just yes. like uh, curling up in a ball and just being sad about it, I can actually go and use that, you know, anger or motivation uh, to like, you know, good use. 100%. And yeah, like stress, anxiety, all that stuff is like so physical sometimes that you just need to let it go. Yep. I think it's, that's fantastic. You're doing a great job. All right, if, Ifan, so two more questions. We'll wrap up shortly because we're, we're well over time. And this is super <laughs> fun. Uh, many would say you're, you're the eSports GOAT, and we've heard on this, this, uh, this podcast that you know your shit, like you know it cold, which is freaking awesome. For someone that knows very little about eSports like me, um, can you catch me up on what I need to know to like how to make, like, how to make money on eSports? I mean, what... I think it may be current trends or just like the basics, you know, educate me with what, what you think would be helpful. Yeah. So first you'd have to like pick the esport that you want to like, you know, learn or get into. So for example, let's what say, would you recommend? Uh, I'd recommend either, uh, I think Counter-Strike is probably the easiest one to learn as a casual okay. because it's just five versus five people and they play and then whoever dies, uh, you know, of the five people wins the round and they, you play to 13 mm. rounds. So it's very basic and very little. Oh, whereas, it's pretty simple. It's very simple. Whereas league is very complex. There's over 130 champions. Each have over like five or six abilities. Um, and so that learning curve is very, it takes at least a month or two to learn about the champions or the people who are playing it to even fully understand it. Whereas Counter Strike, yeah. it's pretty basic. It's people just shooting guns over at uh, uh, you know people. And right now we're during we have a break right now during Counter Strike and should come back yeah. uh, should come back in July uh, here. Okay. Um, so the most recent news about Counter Strike is that Spirit, um, one of the Russian organizations, just won the last major, um, and they had okay. this um, young prodigy who was. Um, originally on their academy team and now he's making waves and making very 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 uh big splash in the main uh scene and his name is donk d-o-n-k like how old is he donk he He is 16 years old and his current are most of these really really good esports players super young uh the up-and-coming ones are you know very young there are still some old ones that are good um, like there's this guy named Dupree who is 33 years old and he's still a very, very solid player. And he's been playing Counter-Strike since when I was, you know, watching way back in yeah. the day. And he's yeah. jumped all over the place. Uh, but the new guys who are definitely coming into the scene, like Donk, he has made a name for himself in a wave. And now the teams are inquiring spirit, like, hey, can we buy, you know, Donk from you guys? And they're setting his price at over five million dollars now. So this wow. Is, How much of that do you think Donk gets paid? Um, I think uh, I'm not too sure what his contract structure is. Um, with Spirit, I know esports is like notorious for like uh, locking in people with long contracts so that they yeah. can get the best value of it. 
Um, but that's just his buy off bonus. Like where yeah, that's crazy. Where you'd buy him off, it would cost five million, and then you need to sign him to like, you know, normal salary wage um for his yeah. Um, input. If I were to guess, he probably makes around a million to two million a year just playing the game, playing video games. Yeah, but his buyout from like the uh, company, if they want to buy out his contract, if he, if another team would want to inquire, is upwards of five million. So it's just crazy seeing, wow. um, you know, him being so good at the game as well as, um, just the the young wave of uh, Counter Strike players is like, uh got to adapt and got to learn more about the up and comers who are coming into the scene. Cause it's really a big deal. Um, so yeah, I would say spirit would probably be the, the team to hear about. There's a lot of roster changes right now. Cause it's quote unquote a player break. So a lot of teams are trying to mm -hmm. fix their rosters into the summertime because um, there's this big thing for the first time happening for esports. Um, which is going to be very, very exciting, and I can't wait to like pump it out. Is Saudi Arabia is hosting something called the Esports World Cup? So there's wow. there's going to be over sixteen different teams invited, and they're going to go through all different esports: Dota, CS:GO, League of Legends, Rocket League, and essentially, since uh, you know how how the Saudis work, they have lots and lots of capital, and that's what they're oh, yeah. able to attract these teams so there's going to be millions of dollars in prize pool winnings for these teams so big big organizations are definitely going to want to go there and participate in the esports world cup to represent their team or represent their nation um and once that's um happening you're going to hear a lot more about esports um this coming month when is that so it's mid happening? mid july is when it starts the World Cup. Wow. The Esports World Cup. It's the first time ever happening. What a summer. Yeah. We've got the Olympic trials this week going into next week. And then we've got the Esports World Cup and then we've got the Olympics. Yep. The Olympics are like thinking about adding esports to uh, they better. The yeah, they should. Well. Absolutely. And that's been discussion within the past uh, couple years as well. Just, I think it's a, it's about viewership, right? It's like what audience. people want to see and watch and it's growing in popularity. Exactly. I think that that's a no brainer. But that, that's uh, the most beautiful thing about esports is that it's, you know, it's, it's like growing, you know, it's so young and it's in the state, totally. it's in the state it's where like it's uh, from grassroots, but now it's starting to become more corporate and more, more kids and kids are getting into it. And even yeah. older people are getting into it more. So if you're in it now, it's a great time to be in it because it's only going to expand. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not a parent yet, but I'd imagine if I have kids and someone tells me, well, if your kid gets really good at video games, like they could be making hundreds of thousands <laughs> of dollars from it. It's like, yeah, sure. Go ahead and play four hours of video games tonight. Like if you don't want to go outside, fine. You know, and one thing that I remember from when I was, I was an, uh, an investor, I think you knew this at a firm for, uh, I was doing like venture capital for like four or five years. Mm -hmm. And I remember meeting a company that was, it was an esports software company. They provided uh, software for people to like teach others how to play, you know, things like CSGO and League of Legends better. Mm -hmm. What was super fascinating to me was one of the co-founders was like a former Air Force fighter pilot. Wow. And he was exceptional at video games. And he was telling me the reason why he was so good is because video games, similar to being in the cockpit, is like super reactionary. So like you, your reflexes have to be absolutely incredible. And it just, it makes sense because it's such a skilled game. Yep. Like I mean, any of them are, you have to be extremely skilled. You have to anticipate, you have to be thoughtful and strategic. And I don't think a lot of people sort of realize that. Like, it's not just like sitting there playing. It's probably pretty stressful, I would imagine, especially if you're playing competitively. Yeah. What am I going off that? One of my friends who's really into F1 racing talks about how, how sim racing has been a huge thing or a huge you know, way for a lot of F1 racers and, you know, Max Verstappen, like in his free time, he'll play, you know, F1 sim. And so instead of actually going out on the track, he's just playing the game and it still yep. feels like he's, you know, training, but he's actually just playing a video game, you know, at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's crazy to see um, the evolution of it and how it can bridge it into either a career or, you know, going pro in it. 
Um, it's very, very cool yeah. seeing a lot of money getting, getting back invested into it. Amen. And so you mentioned, and what we're, this is the finale question, so we'll wrap here. You mentioned how nascent esports is. And I think sports betting is just as nascent, right? We've got, you know, th- I think it's, it counts up to like 35 or something states that have legalized online sports betting. Still not California, although you can play prize picks and underdogs, so I'm, I'm good. <laughs> but it's interesting to think how nascent sports betting is, yet 40 million people in the U.S. bet on sports every week. And 9 in 10 of those people look for information before they bet. So they're looking for people like you to give them information, whether it's you telling them exactly what to do or you giving them data or statistics, whatever it might be. What advice, Afon, do you have for regular sports bettors, people that are betting every week? And then what what advice would you have for someone that's a bit more casual like me? Yeah, I think the number one advice I could give to any gambler, regardless of what you're playing, is bankroll management is the best advice, you know, because gambling is something that messes with your emotions it plays with your emotions a lot um and if you don't have good discipline with how you manage your money you're gonna end up losing all of your money uh gambling and that's kind of what it's designed to do um and that's kind of what i learned early on playing at the casinos was um how you know the casinos operate based off of you know us losing that's how the emotion, that's how they fill you up with drinks. They keep it cool in there. They close the, you know, you don't, there's no windows. So you feel like you're trapped. It, it, Can you describe, let's just say, so, so as you talk about bankroll management, I want you to explain that a little bit for like, you know, again, imagine I have no idea what you're talking about. Let's say you have, you make $10,000 a month, you know, like that's your salary. Uh, you know, you're, you're or like, let's say 5,000 to keep it simpler. You make $5,000 a month. You're out there and you want to bet on sports. How would you recommend allocating that money and how, like, how much would you put towards a bet? Like, how, how would you think about bankroll management if I had $5,000 a month that was coming in from my job? Yeah, so I was around that same standpoint when I was you know, working straight out of college, was making around um, $7,000 a month. And what I would do um, is I'd play around, I'd deposit you know, $500. You, let's just say $200 into like three different accounts. So you pick a number and you're like, this is my bankroll that I'm going to set aside exactly. in, you know, on prize picks, on underdog, and you know, you name it. Exactly. Monkey night P- pick an amount, 200, 300, 400, whichever it may be. I started, I started uh, at like 500. So I did $500 and then all my bets, no matter what, would be $10 unless I had really good conviction on the bet or I really, really, really liked the line, then I would double it to 20 Otherwise, no matter what, I'd keep my bets at $10. So regardless of a good or a bad day, it'd be within that $10 increments. I could increase yep. the number of bets I placed if I you know, like the board or if there's more options to pick from. But no matter what, I stuck to my unit size, which was $10. And over, In- over that time, I'd play with the $10, $10. Let's say you know, after a month, I'm at $1,000. Then I would just restart the process, withdraw 500, be like, hey, this is money that I won gambling, and let's keep going from $10 and keep growing my way up. Yeah, so very disciplined. And it sounds like when you say you're putting $10 down and you have $500 set aside to play, that's your bankroll, you're making $10 wagers and that's what you're, you're staying disciplined to, you would literally have to lose... 50 times in a row to lose all that money. Yeah. It'd take a lot. You know, the probability of that, like, I know I like, it's like almost zero. There is no way that happens because you can't, like, no one can be that bad at picking the outcome of a bet. Yeah. No way. Especially if you're tailing a capper like you, I mean, they would be making a lot of money. Yeah. There might be, you might go down to 300, you might go down to 200, but then you'll definitely make your way back up. And that's the thing with, yeah, it'll just, fluctuate. That's the thing with Most gambling, people with stick waves. around. Exactly. Most, most, I mean, most average, like average sports bettors stick around. Like you start with, I like to say you start with a thousand, you probably end up with like six, 700. The folks that are, I mean, that's 97% of people that bet on sports. And that the reason why is because that's how sports books make money is because they collect what's called a VIG and they're, they're capitalizing on the fact that most people don't do a great job. And then there's the 3% of people like you who consistently will end up with more profit over time. It doesn't mean that like you start out with a thousand 
and you're going to, you know, you're putting down $10 at a time and you're going to end up immediately with 1500 Like you might dip down to 800 mm -hmm. right? But you, you are good enough over time and consistent enough that it's like if, if I'm invested in Amazon and Amazon has like one bad earnings quarter and the stock drops, like, so what? If I look at the chart over 20 years, I'm rich as hell from investing exactly. in Amazon. Exactly. Because it's, it's up and to the right long term. It's a long and I think that's what a lot of people don't really understand when it comes to sports betting. It's you really have to see it long term and enjoy the fun of the moment and enjoy the fun of doing it. But you're going to lose and you're going to lose often if you're betting often. But what I love about Dub Club is that even if you are losing, you're winning more together. Like if I'm, if I'm in your Dub Club and like, I took your advice. Who cares if we lost? Like, man, we all rode this together. Yep. We're in this one together. Exactly. Like, let's get it back. We trust the fun. Hey, even if a fun's not feeling good, he's got mods. Even if the mods aren't, it's like we got a community. You know, we're all in this together mm -hmm. and we'll make it out on the other side. Like, I think that's what's so fun about it. Yeah. And especially with uh, how prize picks and underdog work, like, it's not straight betting. Like, I'm not no. betting, you know, I'm betting on parlays. Like I'm doing two, three, four, five, six leggers. So there might be a week where, you know, I don't hit any. And there might be another week where I hit five or six of them. And that can make up for the week where I didn't hit any of them just because of how the yep. odds work and how the multipliers work with prize picks. And that's the thing that people don't understand the most is that um, on these apps where, you know, parlay betting, whereas... Um, exactly. on like FanDuel or Caesars or, you know, you can do the straight betting and grow over time. But what I'm selling is more fantasy sports because there isn't, you know, esports on these books yet, you know? So I'm, yeah, I actually think that's fascinating because like you make five, $10 bets. Let's say all five of those lose because they're, 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 you know, like four mans, right? It's like you, you're stacking multiple outcomes together together to get a multiplier through prize picks. Let's say you start with, yeah, a thousand, you lose five in a row, you're at 950. One, like 25 X on prize picks will build you back up way over a thousand instantly. So you're actually five of six on winning, but because you got the multiplier and you're managing your bankroll in a disciplined way and people are tailing you consistently everyone's happy exactly exactly it's the and i think a lot of people don't understand the that. long game not the short-term game and that's the thing with gambling is you can see a lot of short-term wins and a lot of you know bang like oh this guy won fifteen thousand dollars today that's insane but you didn't yeah. see the week before where he lost 10 grand you know yeah. gambling or trying to you know work his way up to it um Exactly. So, and I think for you running your business, capitalizing on those moments where you where you are winning, I think is important because in the long run, you are winning. You know, you're a profitable mm -hmm. sports better. And that's why you run a business giving advice on exactly. that. Exactly. So people need to see that. And it's also our job as your technology partner to, to highlight that, mm -hmm. which we will be doing more of um, in the product. So I think all in all, this has been super fun. Fun. I know we're like way over time, oh, so yeah, I, I'm going to wrap us up. This was awesome. I love that you got the win more together in there. Uh, everyone wins more together at Dove Club. You embody that, you know, wholeheartedly, which is really special. It's fun working with you. Yeah, it's great pleasure working with you. I'm very glad I made that switch um, from Patreon over to Dove Club. It's been great actually working with people and meeting, you know, the team behind Dove Club. Um, so nothing but great things from you, you guys and. Uh, again, thanks for talking, Ryan. Of course, fun. Mm -hmm.